Hi guys, welcome to today's MCQ discussion, MCQ discussion number 16. So let's start. First question for the day, the Blalock Thomas Tosic shunt or the Blalock Tosic shunt is done between A. Iota to pulmonary vein, B. Pulmonary vein to subclavian artery, C. Pulmonary artery to Iota or D. The subclavian artery to the pulmonary artery. So pause, think, then we'll discuss. Yeah. So, to answer this question, we need to know about two things. Firstly, we need to know a little bit about TOF or the Tetralogy of Fallow, the condition for which BT shunt was invented. And we need to also know a little bit about the IO2 pulmonary shunting surgeries. And then we'll come back and answer. So, first, let's talk about TOF. So, as the name suggests, it has four components. Pulmonary stenosis, ventricular septal defect, right ventricular hypertrophy, and overriding of iota. So knowing these four components is very important and this is a very, very, very high yield topic. Okay, so before I talk about the pathophysiology of TOF in, in detail, I'll just outline normal circulation or normal physiological circulation. So normally you have deoxygenated blood coming into the right heart from the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava, so superior vena cava and inferior vena cava drain into the right atrium and from the right atrium, the right atrium drains into the right ventricle. And the deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle is then pumped towards the lungs via the pulmonary artery. So here you can see the pulmonary artery and the blood from the right ventricle is pumped into the pulmonary artery, which then takes this to the lungs, right? Blood from the pulmonary artery goes to the lungs. It's oxygenated in the lungs and it comes back to the heart via the pulmonary veins. So why the pulmonary veins, the oxygenated, oxygenated blood from the lungs comes into the left atrium, which then goes to the left ventricle. And from the left ventricle, it is pumped into systemic circulation via the iota. So that was a little bit about normal circulation. We all know that. So what is different in TOF? So TOF is a congenital cyanotic heart disease. So it's a congenital disease. So this child with tetralogy of fallow, this newborn with tetralogy of fallow has two conditions or two defects in his heart. Firstly, he has something called pulmonary stenosis as shown in the diagram. What happens here is there is narrowing of the pulmonary valve or there is narrowing of the pulmonary valve which lies between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. So when this valve is stenosed, there is no outflow from the right heart. So blood from the right heart or deoxygenated blood from the right heart is not or cannot be pumped into the or towards the lungs. The second defect this child is born with is the VST or the ventricular septal defect. So there is a defect in the vent in the ventricular septum and blood from the right heart can then move to the left heart. So there is mixing of blood. So firstly, you had pulmonary stenosis or narrowing of the pulmonary valves due to which blood from the right heart was not able to go towards the lung. And secondly, you have this defect too. So because the blood from the right heart can no longer go towards the lungs, it starts moving into the left heart. So, you know, it's a fluid and when the heart pumps, it has to go somewhere. So it can't move upwards, it can't go towards the lung. So it starts moving towards the left ventricle. So blood from the right ventricle moves into the left ventricle and there is mixing of blood. And then this deoxygenated blood from the right ventricle, which then moved into the left ventricle, is finally pumped into the iota. Okay, it's pumped into the iota and therefore you will have cyanosis. So whenever there is deoxygenated blood in circulation, you have cyanosis, right? So that was how this disease developed. You had pulmonary stenosis and VSD and together this led to deoxygenated blood moving into the left heart and then getting pumped to the rest of the body. Now let's talk about the next two components, the right ventricular hypertrophy and overriding of iota. And these are actually just sequelae of the first two things. So I told you blood from the right ventricle now moves into the left ventricle, right? So you have the right ventricle, which is now pumping for both the left and the right ventricle and is pumping at a higher pressure. So over time, this right ventricle begins to hypertrophy because it's pumping more than the left ventricle and it's pumping into the left ventricle and also pumping for the left ventricle. So over time, this right ventricle begins to hypertrophy, okay? Because there's a high pressure system in the right heart. There's no blood going towards the pulmonary circulation. So your heart keeps trying to pump into pulmonary circulation. Secondly, it's also pumping for the left heart. So over time, you have the third component, which is light vent right ventricular hypertrophy. And lastly, you have the blood. Now here you have the blood of the right ventricle and the left ventricle 
both going into the aorta. So blood from the right and left now are pushed into the aorta. So the aorta begins to get overridden. There's too much blood in the aorta. So the aorta slowly begins to widen and that is called overriding of aorta. So over time, you have your aorta like this and your heart like this. So over time, you have a widened aorta and right ventricular hypertrophy, which causes something which is called the boot shaped heart. And this is typical of tetralogy of fallow. It can even be seen on x-ray. So boot shaped heart is seen in tetralogy of fallow. And now you know why right ventricular hypertrophy combined with overriding of aorta. So again, quickly I'll go through it. A child is born with pulmonary stenosis and VSD because of the pulmonary stenosis, blood can't be pumped into the or towards the lungs and therefore because of the also because of the VSD blood starts moving from the right ventricle to the left ventricle so you have deoxygenated blood in the left ventricle this deoxygenated blood gets pumped to circulation via the iota and therefore you have cyanosis over time because of this system you start developing right ventricular hypertrophy and more and more blood is being pumped into the iota so you also have overriding of iota so remember the predisposing two conditions are pulmonary stenosis and VSD and the other two or the last two uh, last two components of TOF are actually sequelae of the first two. So that was about pathophysiology of TOF. So what's happening here is basically you have a lot of deoxygenated blood in systemic circulation rather in the iota and you have very little or no blood moving into the pulmonary artery. So the idea of BT shunts and other shunts is to create a shunt between this pulmonary artery and the iota which is responsible for systemic circulation so all these pulmonary aortic shunts or iotopulmonary shunts are shunts created between the aortic system and the pulmonary system which in which blood moves from the aortic system to the pulmonary system so you have deoxygenated blood going in the iota and this deoxygenated blood when we create a shunt moves in to the pulmonary artery and then it goes to the lungs gets oxygenated and comes back via the pulmonary veins okay so now we'll talk about the iotopulmonary shunts there are three important shunts bt shunt or the blalock toxic shunt or the blalock thomas toxic shunt is the most important one so i'll talk about that first so what we do in the bt shunt is now this is a hard case of tof in the classical bt shunt or the original bt shunt that was de devised by blalock thomas and toxic you create a shunt between the left subclavian artery and the uh, pulmonary artery so here again i'll go through a little bit of anatomy you have the ascending iota the arch of iota which gives out the brachiocephalic trunk which gives right common carotid and right subclavian then you have the left common carotid which directly arises from the iota and lastly you have the left subclavian artery which again directly arises from the iota so what we do here is we create a shunt okay a connection between the left subclavian and the pulmonary artery Therefore, this deoxygenated blood from the left subclavian will get pumped into the pulmonary artery and via the pulmonary artery will go to the lungs, okay, get oxygenated and come back into the heart via the pulmonary veins. So basically, we are moving blood from the iota to the pulmonary artery so that it can go to the lungs and get oxygenated. So that was about BT shunt. It is between the subclavian artery or the left subclavian artery and the pulmonary artery. There is also something called modified BT shunt in which we choose the right subclavian artery. So we make a connection between the right subclavian artery and the right pulmonary artery. And uh, again, it's the same principle. So that was modified BT shunt. Then there is also something called the water stunts shunt. Okay, so what is this water stunts shunt? You create a shunt between the ascending aorta and the pulmonary artery. So I told you this is the ascending aorta. So you make a shunt somewhere here. So you make a shunt between the ascending aorta and pulmonary artery. So blood from the ascending aorta, which is deoxygenated, is pumped into the pulmonary artery and then it goes to the lungs and comes back oxygenated. Lastly, you have something called a pot shunt in which you make a shunt between the descending iota and the pulmonary artery. Again, the principle is the same. So different sides of the iota, but all pumping into the pulmonary artery, which then takes it to the lungs. So therefore, you should remember the, the principle of all iotopulmonary shunts is to direct blood into the pulmonary artery. So all of these shunts are to direct blood into the pulmonary artery so that it can go for oxygenation. Now we'll go back to the question and answer. So firstly, iota to pulmonary vein, definitely wrong. I told you the principle of all these iota pulmonary shunts is to pump into the pulmonary artery, right? So iota to pulmonary vein is wrong. Pulmonary vein to iota, again wrong or subclavian artery, whatever. So it's pulmonary artery we're looking for. So C is pulmonary artery to iota and D is subclavian artery to pulmonary artery. So pulmonary artery to iota, questionable, but 
you definitely have aorta to pulmonary artery and if it's ascending aorta it's called the water stent shunt and if it is the descending aorta that's selected it's called the pots shunt lastly we have option d which was the answer so the answer for this question was d subclavian artery to pulmonary artery so that's what we did in bt shunting we shunted between the subclavian artery and the pulmonary artery so blood from subclavian artery went into pulmonary and then went for oxygenation so that was about shunting procedures and TOF in brief. Pathophysiology of TOF, very important. Four components of TOF, very important. Pulmonary stenosis, VSD, right ventricular hypertrophy and overriding viata. So if you remember in that order, it's even better. The next two questions are easy, fact-based question, but high yield. So the second question, Jogren syndrome is associated with A, HLA-DR2, B, HLA-DR3, C, HLA-DR4 or D, HLA-B27. So again, Jogren syndrome is an autoimmune condition in which we have dry eyes and dry mouth. There are a series of tests. I'll do a short video on Jogren syndrome, but there are a series of criteria to fulfill. But basically, remember, if a patient has for longer than three months dry eyes or xerostomia, zero, zero uh, sorry, xerostomia and dry mouth xerostomia for more than three months, you should suspect Jogren syndrome. And the HLA associated or the human leukocytic antigen group associated with this disease is HLA-DR3. So I'll tell you a few important HLAs from the exam point of view. Okay, so firstly, all the HLA-DRs. So HLA-DR2 is associated with multiple sclerosis, pernicious anemia and SLE, not too important. Very important is HLA-DR3, okay, which is seen in Jogren syndrome, sometimes in myasthenic and SLE. So SLE had, SLE had two and three, DR2 and three. Okay, but important HLA-DR3 is seen in Jogren syndrome. The most important HLA, in fact, is HLA-DR4, which is seen in rheumatoid arthritis and type one DM and VKH syndrome also, but most importantly, HLA-DR4 for rheumatoid arthritis, HLA-DR5 pernicious anemia may be important. Next, a few HLA-Bs are important, HLA-B5 and B51 seen in Bechet's disease, you know, Bechet's disease, you have oral and genital ulcers, right? HLA-B27 is very important. So the most important first one was HLA-DR4, and the second most important one is HLA-B27, which is seen in all your uh, Zero negative arthritis, so ankylosing spondylitis, reactive arthritis or Rater syndrome, and psoriatic arthritis. Also seen in association with IBD, if you can remember that, inflammatory bowel disease, also has an association. That is your ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, also have an association with HLA-B27. HLA-B7, multiple sclerosis, again, not important. But if you can remember, DR2 and B7, both for multiple sclerosis. Now, Again, I told you the most important HLA, B27 and DR4. Remember DR4, rheumatoid arthritis. You can remember type 1, diabetes mellitus. But please don't forget HLA, DR4 for rheumatoid arthritis. HLA, DR3 for Jogren syndrome. HLA, DR2, again, not too important, but you can remember SLA and uh, MS. And HLA, B27, again, all your zero negative arthropathies and inflammatory bowel disease. So the answer was B, HLA, DR3. Let's go to the third question. Okay, insomnia, very high yield topic. So according to the DSM-5 criteria, a diagnosis of insomnia disorder can be made when there is disturbed sleep lasting for A. At least 3 nights a week for at least 3 months B. At least 5 nights a week for at least 3 months C. At least 3 nights a week for 5 months or more or D. At least 5 nights a week for 5 months or more So here, they're looking for a criteria. Again, a fact-based question but insomnia disorder is a high yield topic So I hope you guys have answered the answer here is A, at least three nights for at least three months, at least three nights a week for three months. So you can only say an individual has insomnia when he has sleeplessness or disturbed sleep for at least three nights a week for a period of three months. Okay, so let's talk a little about insomnia disorder. More importantly, about the TSM-5 criteria for insomnia disorder. So insomnia disorder is any sleep disturbance that is present for at least three nights a week lasting for at least three months. So three and three, very important. Now let's talk about DSM-5 criteria. There are eight criteria, okay? So firstly, there should be complaints of disturbance of sleep, either in quantity or quality of sleep or both. So disturbed quantity, quality or both of sleep. It can present as difficulty in initiating sleep. So patients find it difficult to go to sleep or difficulty in maintaining sleep. So they sleep, they wake up, sleep, wake up. So it's a very disturbed sleep. And lastly, it can also present with early morning wakening and inability to sleep again. So that is also seen in depression, right? So early morning wakening and inability to sleep again. So any of these three or all of these three can be present in a case of insomnia. So the first thing is they should have complaints of disturbed sleep, either quality or quantity. Second point is 
it should cause some impairment of daily activity so it's not that i i sleep 4 hours or my sleep quota is 4 or 6 hours but i expect to sleep 8 or 10 hours so everyone has different sleep needs and you can say a person has insomnia only when his daily activity is affected because of his lack of sleep so sleep timings vary for different people right so the third thing is sleep difficulty occurring at least three nights a week. So I told you this three nights and the fourth thing was lasting for three months or more. So three nights a week, three and three are the most important criteria. So disturbance in sleep, either quantity or quality with impairment of daily functioning and occurring for at least three nights a week, such a thing happening for more than three months. And it should not be attributable to any other disorder, drugs or other medical illness. So this, these sleep disorders, drugs and other medical illness are all individual points themselves that's how it becomes eight and i have only written six so remember it cannot be attributed to any sleep wake disorder drugs or other mental illness it should be completely exclusive okay and lastly the individual should get enough or adequate opportunity to sleep so only if any for example an internal pg doesn't get adequate opportunity to sleep and if they go and say i'm having insomnia it's not actually insomnia it's just that they haven't got the opportunity to sleep so very important adequate opportunity to sleep is also a point in the dsm5 criteria and impairment of daily function there's another question in which impairment of daily function is in question so this is the dsm5 criteria for diagnosing insomnia so three high yield topics we discussed and one concept in good detail so we'll continue the discussion tomorrow see you guys bye